I'd like to start by uh, thanking the sponsors of tonight's event, uh, and they are the University of Washington Center for Human Rights, Town Hall Seattle, Elliott Bay Book Company, the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies, and the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. I'm immensely proud to introduce tonight's speakers, who are two courageous and visionary individuals who, who have brought to light and helped us understand the United States torture and abuse of prisoners. Ian Fishback served in four combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan from 2001 to 2010. In September 2005, he wrote a letter to Senator John McCain that brought national attention to the continuing abuse of prisoners by the United States in the so-called War on Terror. In 2006, he was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People for his role in reforming detainee treatment standards in the US military. Joshua Phillips is a prize-winning investigative journalist who has reported from Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and South Asia. He has interviewed soldiers, their families, and friends, military officials, and victims of torture. He is the author of the book, None of Us Were Like This Before, American Soldiers and Torture, which is on sale tonight and which he is happy to autograph for you. His work has appeared in The Washington Post, Newsweek, The Atlantic, The Nation, Salon, and The San Francisco Chronicle, and The Atlantic Journal Constitution, among other publications. His radio features have been broadcast on NPR and the BBC and he is the recipient of the Haywood Brown Award and the DuPont Award for journalistic excellence. Please join me in welcoming Ian Fishback and Joshua Phillips. Thanks, everyone. Yes, good evening. Um, do you want me to start? Or yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, Ian's catching up flight, so. So, uh, first thing that I'll say right off the bat is uh, these are my own personal views. They're not the views of the U.S. Army or the official views of the U.S. government. It's pretty obvious, but I want to make that clear at the outset. Um, I'll keep the opening remarks fairly brief uh, in the interest of getting to your questions. Normally, I address military personnel, and when I do, and I'm talking about preventing torture or protecting human rights in war, um, I try to frame it in terms of the psychological pressures and the exigencies of war that they will face as individual soldiers and what they have to do to prevent human rights abuses on the battlefield, which is a little bit different than talking to you as individual citizens. But it's not that you as individual citizens aren't important in this process. Um, we're the specialists and we're professionals, which means we're entrusted by you to perform certain services and tasks that you can't perform for yourself, at least not to as high of a level. Um, there's usually two components um, with being a professional. Uh, one is ethical. You have your own ethical code that pertains to your, par your area of expertise. For example, doctors have the Hippocratic Oath. Um, lawyers will have their own code of ethics, et cetera. Um, the other side of the coin is proficiency and being good at using violence to accomplish certain ends. Usually, when we frame the torture debate, we frame it in terms of the former and not so much in terms of the latter. Which is unfortunate, not because the ethical component isn't important. Um, torture is very bad, and it's, it's wrong on its own merits for a variety of reasons. I'm not certain that it's so bad that it's in a separate category from the rest of what we do in war. For example, if I were to choose between some things that are torture um, and ripping the limbs off a small child, there are some forms of torture I might prefer, as heinous as that sounds. Um, and yet we do kill children in war. So it's not clear to me torture is necessarily worse than everything else we do in war, which might speak badly for war, but that's a separate issue. Um, on the other hand, this efficacy problem is huge, and it's I think when soldiers focus on the ethics, they tend to think, well, that means that this must be effective. 
and that I'm being told I can't do this even though it works, when in actuality that's not the case. And what's at least as tragic in this whole situation is the amateurish nature with which we've gone about the torture problem. Um, since September 11th, we have literally behaved like a bunch of amateurs. Um, the torture program was built it, around Sears School. It mimics techniques that were used in Soviet gulags that were primarily designed to instill fear and in political oppression and engender, prop, or engender cooperation to generate propaganda. It was not primarily, gulags were not primarily designed to generate actionable intelligence. And so we sacrificed some of our most important values <laughs> to mimic the Soviets. And we did that in order to accomplish ends that gulags weren't even designed for. Um, that's kind of sad. Um, and it, Josh and I were talking about this earlier today. There's really not a lot of convincing evidence that torture works. And there's a lot of evidence that it doesn't. Um, the best Nazi interrogators uh, were the ones who used soft interrogation techniques. And if the Nazis wanted to get information from a high value source, they would often bring these interrogators in. Now clearly we know this isn't because the Nazis were uh, averse to torture. Unfortunately, they did it for fun. And yet when they really wanted information, they would bring a soft interrogator in. That should tell you something. Uh, the Japanese would distribute orders and instructions during World War II to their subordinate commanders that when they were interrogating valuable prisoners, they needed to stop using harsh techniques because they were ineffective. I mean, these are indicators that this is not a productive enterprise. And yet, we did not pay attention to that evidence. Um, so th th those are a few of the points I point out to soldiers. Now, I'm relaying that to you, um, and usually it's a little bit more in depth than this, but I'm relaying that to you as private citizens because it's important that you make your fellow citizens aware of this to some degree. You're not expected to be as knowledgeable as the rest of us, but we are in a democracy. And one of the things that's going to constrain the military speaking out against politicians is our concern for civilian military relations. And we really have a strong norm. It's morally important that we don't contradict the representatives that you elect in public. Um, and we generally adhere to that norm. Um, so the unfortunate side effect of that is that in a lot of instances, it's up to you to be knowledgeable about this and hold the representatives accountable because, quite frankly, the military is not going to speak to you with an open mind in the public forum. Um, that's because we have a norm that protects democracy from the military itself. And we often feel this tension. There's a tension between protecting the civilian military norm and the tension of um, promoting all kinds of morally important policies um, within the military and within the United States. So um, that's, that's to close my remarks because try to leave a lot of room for questions. Um, Josh. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> um, when I'm invited to speak about torture, I find that there's a certain portion of, of the audience that's sort of wondering, why are we even discussing this now? I mean, you know, Abu Ghraib happened in 2004, it was publicly revealed then. Um, the Guantanamo torture program existed around 2002, 2003, and the CIA's black sites and uh, secret torture program was shut down in 2006. But we're still experiencing the legacy of torture today, and it still exists in the public discourse. Um, just last year, Mitt Romney's advisors encouraged him to consider reversing Obama's executive decisions and reintroduce um, enhanced interrogation techniques for high-value detainees um, and of course, after the Boston bombing, uh, we had yet again another public discussion 
mostly confined to Fox News and the like, about revisiting torture, um, exposing the Boston bombing suspects, uh, to, or the suspect, I should say, rather, um, to enhanced interrogation. Uh, so what's interesting to me is this, and what interested me in, even before I started working on the book was how the discussion of torture had been framed and how the media had kind of latched onto it almost unwittingly. They were almost taking um, almost an uncritical examination of the talking points that the Bush administration officials were putting forward. That is, um, Cheney and his acolytes were basically arguing torture was legal, right? We did it on our, on our soldiers through the SEER program that, uh, that Ian mentioned, um, the, the program in which pilots and special forces go through. Uh, so it is legally permissible to use it on detainees. Uh, it was limited, that is, they argued that, for example, waterboarding, the only technique we really hear about, was used on three detainees. Um, it produced an abundant amount of intelligence and left no lasting damage, no great damage. But the more one probes in a serious way um, what U.S. forces did, you know, you understand, A, that we're being duped by that argument, by myopically focusing on things like the CIA program and waterboarding, um, and that it's a, uh, that the, the true nature, B, of torture was far more vast and pervasive during the early part of the war on terror uh, than most Americans understand it to be. Um, for example, the Department of Defense announced in 2006 that it conducted 842 criminal investigations and inquiries into torture, okay? So most people associate torture with, say, Abu Ghraib. They don't understand, 842, it seems like a vast number. Um, in 2011, I, I published an article for The Nation, which was also for PBS, and military investigators there even said that there were likely, this is the, the military investigators that were specifically charged with doing investigations into uh, detainee abuse and torture. It was their expectation that there were probably hundreds, if not thousands of cases of detainee abuse and torture that they never even got to see it, and see and, and follow through in terms of uh, doing a proper investigation. So there was, for a period of time, um, a far greater amount of, of detainee abuse and torture than the public is aware of. And um, in a way, we have been tricked into uh, just following this very narrow paradigm of torture that, again, torture apologists and proponents continue to advocate to this day. Um, the part of what this talk is about is, is the legacy of torture, confronting the legacy of torture. So on the one hand, you still have this discourse that's living in the ether. Um, about the efficacy of torture, and um, you know, it, it emerges every now and then through a Boston bombing situation, or through the controversy stirred through Zero Dark Thirty, or after, of course, Osama bin Laden got captured, there were people who were uh, claiming that the intelligence connected to um, the location and elimination of bin Laden was a direct result of, of torture. Um, so one of the questions that I was interested in was both how we turned to torture, how U.S. forces turned to torture. And by forces, I'm including both the, the officials themselves, senior officers, interrogators, and service members who were not tasked or trained or had any expectation of turning to torture. And there was one unit in particular that I thought exemplified this. I'm happy to talk about all those other um, dimensions. I mean, the, there, there are parallels, there are very interesting parallels between the expectations um, and the situations that led senior officials and interrogators, even trained interrogators, to believe that um, using coercive interrogation, enhanced interrogation, torture, was permissible, necessary, and effective. 
Um, but if one looks at the, the files, the declassified uh, files of um, investigations into detainee abuse and torture, um, the, you find that most occurred on remote forward oper operating bases. Um, and, and so I was curious about that, wondering, okay, so how did this happen? And there was one battalion in particular that I followed that I thought um, was illustrative. Uh, it was a small tank battalion um, that was part of the initial insertion into Iraq in 2003. And like many units at that time, um, they were entering the country with the expect with the that is Iraq with the expectation that they would be fighting a conventional war. And of course, that war changed very dramatically, very quickly around mid-2003, and so people who had no training and background with uh, interrogation or detainee operations were suddenly thrust in a position of having to do both, detention and interrogation operations. And in the course of meeting and interviewing the, um, the soldiers that were involved in this unit, they told me both what they had done, which included things like force exercises, then sleep deprivation, then in some cases things as severe as mock execution, right? Uh, and in one instance even waterboarding. But the reasons they gave were very complex and varied, such as um, disciplining detainees, right? I mean, we typically think of a coercive interrogation or an abusive detention situation being symptomatic of an interrogation, but in point of fact, that's only one of the reasons. I mean, there were other, the most commonly cited reason was the, for the, for the purposes of um, uh, maintaining order, uh, disciplining detainees, as I said. Um, then there were instances where soldiers would say that abuse became a byproduct of, um, of rage and frustration over battlefield operations that weren't going well. Some soldiers even said that they uh, were bored and abuse became an outlet of boredom, which is not an uncommon thing. But the, one of the things that I learned was that it wasn't simply a matter of orders or memos. Um, for much of, much of the criticism on the left has been that, that um, there was a top-down um, structure of torture, that it, is, that it was uh, conceived of by uh, Bush administration officials codified in memos, distributed, trickled down to the troops, they turned to torture, and I think it's a, there's some truth to that, but it's uh, overstated and, and inaccurate. Um, but one of the important points here um, that I learned from the, the troops that were involved in this battalion and in other detention operations um, was that for some of them, those who felt uh, guilty or remorseful about their involvement in abuse and involvement in torture. Um, some of them who came home uh, were terribly affected. Um, they were greatly psychologically traumatized by their experience. And um, it's not an uncommon experience, but it's one that isn't very well recognized. And in the case of this particular unit, there were members of it who struggled with, um, with rage, depression, substance abuse, and some of the unit members even took their lives, including a guy that I had known for three and a half years. And so, as I said, this is something that isn't new, but it is sadly a byproduct of our experience, our legacy with torture. Um, as Ian said, the other part of this is um, the, the, the grading effect that torture has had on military operations themselves. So when we talk about efficacy, right, we're thinking about it in terms of that is the eff efficacy of torture, or supposed efficacy of torture. Um, we're thinking about it in terms of um, physical pressure being applied to a detainee to get actionable intelligence. There are all kinds of problems with this. Uh, you know, there even, well, especially trained interrogators will talk about the deleterious effects that pain and duress has on a detainee. Um, and 
And that's where I think you're absolutely right in talking about the, the amateurish n nature of um, our involvement in torture because we've known, seasoned interrogators have known for a long time that it affects memory and recall, right, when you use torture. Uh, even the CIA's own research scientists pointed out the degrading effects of pain on collecting intelligence. Um, it affects our capacity to gain intelligence through public cooperation, which for many intelligence anal analysts is the backbone of intelligence operations. And then one other part of this, um, and, and this is not insignificant, is that um, in the course of um, meetings with the Senate Armed Services Committee and doing investigations into our involvement in torture and detainee abuse, Alberto Mora, who is the former uh, Navy General Secretary, admitted in the course of the, the meetings that um, through discussions with flag rank officers, he learned that the number one and number two greatest sources of insurgent recruitment in Iraq and therein coalition deaths were the images of Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo respectively. So this, um, the, this blowback effect of torture, this deleterious effect of torture um, has had a, a serious and myriad effects um, and the great fear is, I haven't even mentioned the detainees of course, and, and that's a whole other um, matter that I can get into afterwards, but um, the, 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 the concern that I've heard from um, people who are involved in uh, the high value um, interrogation group, for example, which is, this, um, th they were involved in the interrogation of um, uh, the Boston bombing suspect. They're um, a, a network of military interrogators, FBI um, and law enforcement interrogators. And they worry, they are gravely concerned that because we haven't really reckoned with torture, because um, per Obama's wishes we have looked forward and not backward, we have not had serious accountability in any meaningful way, that under the right conditions, or wrong conditions, I should say, um, you know, a, another war, a change in president, uh, one who believes in returning to enhanced interrogation techniques, heaven forbid another terrorist attack, um, we could sadly be revisiting this stuff all over again. So that's it for my remarks. I'm happy to um, take questions for both of us. So go ahead. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Ian, um, thank you for that uh, perspective on torture in reference to what we do in war. That's the first point that always needs to be made. Um, but you were talking about the Uniform Code of Military Justice, UCMJ. Um, when a, the White House lawyer, uh, I guess it was Philip Buke, can just put a memo out and discuss, well, this is what torture is now, and this is what we think. And the system can't fight a memo and say, no, this isn't what it is. And when you have a memo that creates law, what does that do to, I mean, what have you learned from what it does to the trust that the military has about civilian rule? Well, <laughs> do you understand that's what complicated. No, I do understand what you're saying. That's, that's why this is such a complicated and morally challenging dilemma for military officers. It's very clear that we have a duty, a legal and a moral duty to disobey an unlawful order to torture. Um, when the orders first came down, most, well, at least a lot of JAG officers said that the, the proposed policy was immoral and illegal. Uh, the first commander of Guantan Guantanamo Bay was replaced in part because he followed the letter of that law. Uh, and people above him in the chain of command wanted somebody who, I think the exact quote I think was take the gloves off. I think that for General Miller, wasn't it? Take the gloves off. Um, there was covert black, but 
It was, I mean, it transferred in essence. Yeah. Um, so what do you do as a military professional when that happens? Well, some people are willing to resign, and some people did resign. Um, but it's a completely separate matter to go in front of the United States and publicly criticize uh, politicians. And the reason we don't do that is because we want to protect our democracy. Um, and that's the dilemma that a lot of these officers found themselves in. I myself was actually willing to bite the bullet and go to jail on that count. If somebody had said you violated civil military relations, I would have been willing to face punishment for that because I felt like that was the really dark side, the dangerous risk that I was assuming in my own actions. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what happened was probably the best case scenario circa 2005. It should have happened earlier but around 2005, there's a critical mass of military officers that just say, this is wrong, and we're not going to do it anymore. Do I th it's my personal opinion that more military officers should have stepped up and assumed responsibility for what happened in a public way instead of blaming their subordinates. Um, but setting that off to the side, there are a lot of military officers who go up to the administration and say, look, we're not going to be involved in this. And we're going to reinstitute a policy that prevents this from happening in the military. Um, and that, that's a good news story. But again, bottom line is we're accountable to our civilian leadership. And we protect that relationship even if it exacts certain moral costs in other areas. Ultimately, the buck stops at you because the civilian leadership is accountable to you. And we're going to testify in front of Congress with candid, open, forthright testimony. But you're not going to find very many officers that are going to go onto Fox News or MSNBC or anything like that. So if that's where you're looking for your information, you're not going to find it. You're going to see exactly what General Shinseki did when he testified about the number of troops in Iraq. Went in front of Congress, told him how many troops it was going to take in Iraq, according to his professional opinion, got fired for it, went home. That's it. So um, <clears throat> on the lines of um, accountability, how do you propose that we institutionalize the type of transparency necessary uh, to ensure that U.S. forces don't engage in torture tactics without a sacrificing the obscurity needed to protect matters of national interest? Um, I want you to get as many answers. Yeah, so I'll just keep going until I have to leave. Yeah. Um, so that's a great question actually I like that. so this is this is one of the huge problems with torture and we already have an institutional mechanism that helps us overcome this so you got security interests and in not revealing how you conduct interrogations they're legitimate security interests um but there's this obvious epistemic problem where we can't access the truth and really find out what's objectively working or what's actually going on and actually, the ICRC fulfills this function. Um, the ICRC's job is not to bring to light abuses to the public. Its job is to go investigate and bring it back to the actual government who's conducting the interrogations. They don't go tell the enemy. They don't tell the opposing government or whoever they are. They go tell the government that's conducting the interrogations, that's holding the prisoners, so that they can clean up their own act. And I think that's the model we need to reify and return to. Um, more than that, the ICRC, um, it serves as kind of a flag for people for who's actually following these conventions and not. And people keep looking at the ICRC as this obstacle, or some people keep looking at the ICRC as an obstacle. I think this is very misguided. I think a much better approach would be to use the ICRC, be open about it, and try to encourage your enemies to use it. And if they're not using the ICRC, then that should flag to the population what kind of government our enemies are gonna try to institute. And it should flag to them that they're committing human rights violations, and that works to our advantage. Um, so that's how I would deal with the transparency issue. It's not easy. Um, 
it, it's in some ways the most important problem and why we end up with all these bizarre empirical claims that are totally unfounded, but. Thank you. I have um, a, a question and a comment. The first, the question is that um, our troops are extremely well trained and your comment about uh, forward um, bases, torture being used for discipline or out of boredom mm -hmm. uh, made me think that there is nothing included in troop training that addresses the ineffectiveness or actual uh, negative uh, consequences of torture for frontline troops. Uh, it, and which is surprising to me if, if it indeed isn't an integral part of that. And also, you know, I wonder if, if it isn't, is it just because the assumption is, well, we don't do that, or if we do, we don't talk about it? I'll go halfway and then I'll get out of here and you can answer the rest of it. Um, so that was actually one of the points that when, when Josh said that, it's like, uh, we, we are trained and we have institutional mechanisms to overcome the human tendencies to do this type of abuse. Um, so skill level one task for soldiers is how to handle detainees, a very simple task. You get five S's. Some of those S's are things like safeguard the prisoner so they don't get abused. Speed the prisoner to the rear where interrogators will take care of them. Um, the idea is to get them out of the hands of frontline units and into another, u another unit's hands to kind of get a level of separation from, say, somebody who just had his friend killed or something like that. Um, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, those institutions were undermined. And we violated our own doctrine. Part of this, as <laughs> we were talking about this earlier, is um, be careful you don't, <laughs> you don't ascribe malevolence where incompetence will do the job and be, provide a much better explanation. So the failure to resource and plan the invasion of Iraq led to a lot of problems with second, third order effects like this. Um, we didn't have enough people to handle all the detainees, which is just, quite frankly, negligence. Uh, it's inexcusable that we didn't plan for those types of things. Absolutely inexcusable. If you look at the planning that went into the first Gulf War compared to the planning that went into the invasion of Iraq, First Gulf War ICRC says, best handling of detainees by any government in any war ever. And then we look at Iraq in 2003. And a lot of that has to do with bad leadership. So, so you, you say there's sort of the five S's of training. Is there actual information provided on the ineffectiveness of torture and the negative effects of torture or has it or, or does the, the Army just not accept that that's true? Um, we don't do as good of a job at that as we should. So that's one thing that hopefully we're correcting right now. It's one of the things I really try to hammer home with people. Um, the unfortunate fact is there's this intuitive sense that torture works. And I think just human beings in general, I think are overly optimistic in their assessment of how well violence will work. And that's hard to overcome. So soldiers aren't taught that. You're, um, you're, but it's this, thing, this issue of actually saying it is not bad, but it is to our detriment. We can't, well, I mean, it seems like we cannot depend on sort of the morals, sort of the moral argument. And if, they are, if, if we're not doing more than that, we're not gonna get anywhere. Correct, but here, I'm, this is gonna be my last point. The problem is that you get positive feedback that it works, so we talked about Colonel West. The, the point is, it doesn't work to win the war. It doesn't work in a broader picture to protect the force. But you can get a one-shot instance where torture works. Keep in mind, this is much more likely to work with somebody who doesn't possess valuable intelligence than somebody who does. Somebody who's selected, motivated, trained, goes through SEER school is unlikely to provide you with actual intelligence in a timely manner. But if you get a low-level thug in Iraq who places IEDs and you beat him up, he might give you information. And if he does, the feedback is immediate, the causal chain is clear, whereas if 
you get a detainee and you beat him up and he's, he doesn't provide you information or there's blowback or something, it's really hard to establish the causal chain. I'm reminded of a squadron commander in Iraq who, and it, it wasn't torture, but we were literally running over people's houses, the outside walls of their houses with tanks and getting it wrong like 50% of the time about who we were targeting. And the squadron commander in 2003, it's probably the same unit you were talking about before, I think, said something like, we've been here for three weeks and insurgent attacks have in increased like fourfold. I don't understand what's going on. Well, <laughs> okay, so they're not gonna put a big sign up while you're still there with a the tank saying, I'm gonna try to kill you tomorrow. The feedback's not gonna be that obvious. But you've still got a causal chain and you're still undermining your war effort. Um, if you, the, the problem is like you can, perfect, perfect case study. Algeria, the French in Algeria. If you, if you study the French in Algeria and their use of torture, um, they use torture to get actionable intelligence and it works on a tactical level. They actually destroy a lot of insurgent cells. However, comma, they lose the war. But the feedback mechanism is harder for people to appreciate, especially for soldiers who get myopically focused on the tactical objectives. But anyway, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to leave. Um, thanks so much for your interest and your concern. Hello, you, you mentioned Zero Dark Thirty, <laughs> and I, I just have yes. to follow up because yes. what about the media and the ethics of the media? Um, I actually haven't seen it, but the word is that it implies that uh, torture resulted in catching Bin Laden. Right, well, so one of the surprising things that I turned up um, along the way in, in doing the research, and, and Ian and I were talking about this extensively this morning, and I was telling him, I said, you know, the thing that really shocked me in the course of the research that I did um, was after doing scores of interviews with senior officials and those who were involved in the memos, I couldn't find anything, any data, any empirical evidence, any research at all that showed the supposed efficacy of torture. Nothing. So then what informs these beliefs? Well, it's kind of shocking. It's informed by myths about, fiction, about uh, torture um, and they, they range in various ways, you know, simply from um, the, you know, the fact that you can um, calibrate pain and duress in a certain way that will produce actionable intelligence. Um, pseudoscience about how you're not going to cause brain damage uh, to someone while you're doing that, or that uh, within 16 hours someone will crack, right? Um, there are also um, ideas about torture that, inform, that are informed by fiction. And this is something that is uh, shocking, but not uncommon at all. <laughs> and Zero Dark Thirty represents that in certain ways, but is by no means alone in that regard. Um, I should say that with respect to Zero Dark Thirty, I actually wrote a piece about this for The Atlantic, and I was thinking about this interrogator in Iraq in particular, who uh, basically explained how this worked, right? So here was a guy who was, on, he was a trained interrogator, he was on a mobile interrogation team in Iraq. Um, the, he's on a forward operating base, they're under heavy assault, they have a commander who thinks that, who's unfamiliar with interrogation work, um, but he has certain expectations, like within 30 minutes you should be able to get a confession Okay. Um, at the same time, they are being flooded with detainees because they're desperate to figure out who is bombing them. So imagine a situation where you have one trained interrogator on a team of six interrogators doing 30 minute interrogations with the expectation that they're going to get intelligence and rarely succeed. Um, and the detainees that you are interrogating are, are getting picked up for all kinds of haphazard reasons, like carrying a cell phone, because cell phones at a certain point of time were being used to detonate improvised explosive devices, or uh, because they had a picture of Saddam Hussein in their house. Um, this is very common. Even the military's own data showed that 
Uh, the vast majority of people who were picked up uh, during the early part of the war there were picked up for these haphazard reasons. So essentially, the whole system of intelligence collection broke down. And in, um, in, in, in order to, to figure out what they, were, what they could do effectively, uh, the, these interrogators were kind of grasping, right? They were grasping at what worked. So there were two things that, that happened. One, they were working next to a, um, a, 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 a team of special forces, a SEAL team, like the folks that eliminated bin Laden. And the special forces were using torture. And they thought, if they're using torture on detainees who are supposedly of a, a high value, then maybe we should be doing the same thing, right? Because the expectation is that they're having greater success and targeting people who supposedly have great intelligence. But the other thing was, uh, was that they would take breaks and they would watch the, they would watch uh, movies and TV on a big screen TV in their office. And what did they see but these dramatic scenes of torture cracking a, a, uh, a, a prisoner, a suspect. And the guy who um, uh, I spoke to about this, Tony Lagaranis is his name, who wrote a book called Fear Up Harsh, by the way. Um, he said, you know, we're not idiots, but still this stuff affects you. And in a desperate circumstance, when you have um, these intense pressures of bombing and these tremendous pressures of um, being able to crack a detainee as quickly and as dramatically <laughs> as what you see on TV, those sorts of things drive further expectations about what you ought to do. And that is, in short, how I think um, myths and fiction can affect um, and, and have, of course, a, a dangerous impact on, um, on, on forces who engage in interrogation. I could go on and on about this, honestly, um, about the origins of this, but um, other questions, yes. During the last 40 years, our country has made the transition from uh, armed services that are largely uh, drafted right. to a uh, professional army now. Mm -hmm. Has that changed the situation? There's a, a few things I would say about that. I, you know, generally, it's the trained professionals who are the ones who argue very forcefully against torture. Now, Ian um, was a, in the Special Forces. He was not an interrogator. But the fact is um, that, and part of the reason why I really enjoyed having him here, <laughs> is that I find that it's the members of the military, and particularly those who are seasoned members of the military, who have some degree of specialized training, especially in intelligence, especially in interrogation, who make the strongest, most robu ro robust, forceful, cogent arguments against torture, and who, and who can explain not just the costs, but how um, the, the mechanism be, be behind how one develops a rapport with a detainee um, and how one is able to manipulate a detainee, and that is not um, effective when you introduce physical coercion. Um, and so I think that although I, I think, you know, we should have national service and that would generally help us avert future wars. <laughs> I think that um, even with an all-volunteer service, it would behoove us to just have better uh, trained uh, service members um, who can do proper interrogations. I mean, part of the problem was, it, you know, it wasn't just a matter of training. Um, it was a matter of, uh, you know, wartime situations and underlying beliefs. And essentially what happened was the military broke down badly <laughs> because there were some people who had very zealous, uninformed ideas about torture, who informed policy that both led to torture and that accelerated it. And then you had this um, understanding by the military forces that the rules did not apply because these detainees were not regarded, were not protected with prisoner of war protections guaranteed under common article three of Geneva, the understanding by our soldiers was that 
we enjoyed latitude with them, right? So, you know, even among trained folks, um, there was a belief that the rules did not apply and that um, harsh techniques were both um, approved and encouraged. So, more questions. Hi. So, speaking of very well-trained military professionals, <laughs> Uh -oh. We have the recent example now, 50-year trained professional, James Steele, was someone who was trained in Vietnam by the military, was brought in in, 19, in the mid-80s to teach torture and to develop death squads in Central America in the 80s. He was brought back into Panama to do the same thing in the late 80s. And then he was brought in by Rumsfeld, clearly with the knowledge of Petraeus and the military, upper echelons to develop torture systems in Iraq in 2004. So my question is, in terms of steel, and also how the media has dealt with it here, the fact that most people don't know about it, but it's been major news in Europe, extensively covered by the BBC and The Guardian, and also I wanted to specifically ask about Fragmentary Order 242. Mm -hmm. um, what does that really tell us about torture? Because what I've been hearing is, torture is sort of this low-level thing that people do in the fog of war and James Steele is, is an exemplar of intentional, directed torture. So. Right, okay, so um, let me first say this. The, the story I talked about, or the description about torture that I described didn't deal with the CIA's program, right? There's no doubt <laughs> at all that the Bush administration was directly involved in hatching that policy. That was very much top-down, um, created uh, by members of the Bush, Bush administration um, that was uh, signed off by the Office of Legal Counsel and the Justice Department. Um, so that was a, a directly controlled, uh, top-down torture program that lasted about five years. Um, and Bush and Cheney have both been very unapologetic about it. Steele, well, I know the piece, and it's funny because I happen to be doing some reporting on uh, El Salvador lately, um, but I, I don't think that piece is um, completely fleshed out. Uh, yes, he was involved in counterinsurgency in Vietnam, yes, he was involved in, um, in counterinsurgency in El Salvador. We don't really know much. Um, do you know much, Angelina, about what he was involved in in El Salvador? No, okay, so yeah, I think it's shrouded in mystery still. But I don't know about his involvement with um, the Wolf Brigade in Anbar province. I just think that to say that he necessarily was involved in training torture is a step too far. I absolutely think that they look the other way. Um, this is another problem, it's a different problem, it's a related problem, um, in the sense that the Iraqi forces and the Afghan forces are, yes, absolutely involved in torture. It's been widely documented, it's a big problem. Um, it kind, it's kind of hard to be critical of another state engaging in torture when we ourselves were involved in torture and we held no one accountable. I mean, for God's sake, um, there have been 200 detainee deaths during U.S. interrogation and detention operations. No one has served more than five months for a detainee-related death, and that includes people who were severely tortured. So it kind of cheapens our ability to exact strong and successful criticism. Um, so the fragmentary order was basically a directive on the book that um, that that's right. So there was a press conference though, right, in which you I don't remember which military commander it was. But the military commander is saying, we absolutely have to have a role in intervening. And Rumsfeld said, actually, I don't think so. And they went back and forth, and there was this clear tension. So, you know, it's a complicated story in the sense that, um, and even you and I were talking about this today, there was, there, was some of, there was some violence that was permitted, absolutely. Maybe a lot. But at the same time, um, when, for example, 
Um, we learned, the coalition forces learned, that the Afghan forces, the Afghan secret forces, were involved in um, secretly detaining and torturing people, we eliminated cooperation for a time. We suspended cooperation with them. We weren't, that is, in the sense of giving them detainees. So this is a complicated history, I think. Um, now, I will say, though, just given what you were talking about, the, the bigger impact that Steele probably had was in terms of counterinsurgency. And I would say that's probably the case both in Vietnam and El Salvador and maybe even Iraq. And that's where I think things went poorly. Yeah. Um, but I could go on about this, I suppose, but go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, and this might be a, a question better suited to your, uh, forget his last name, Ian. Fishback. Uh, uh, Fishback, yeah. yeah. So if you don't want to answer it, I'll have another one. But otherwise, <laughs> I'll try. let I'll me try. just uh, yeah. say it seems like he pretty well debunked the idea that uh, abuses were responsibility of, of a top-down, certain few just at the top. And I, and I also understand from the few passages that I've read in your book mm. and from the, the report recently re released by some members of Congress that it, it wasn't the Constitution just a project, yeah. Exactly. It wasn't mm -hmm. just a few bad apples that, that we no. could blame uh, at the bottom level. So it corresponds to the idea that it's more of a structural uh, issue in the military. And I was wondering if you were able to identify anything in particular um, any, any of those structures or components of our military or, or of that lifestyle that, that might? I can answer this question. <laughs> we don't need Ian for this. Uh, although he probably give a great answer as well. So, um, right, yes, I would say that, uh, I don't mean to discount the nature of the directives because as I said, they did play an important part it's a different relationship, though, with the CIA. The CIA was very much controlled and um, created, conceived, executed by the Bush administration. The military story is, is messier and much more complicated. Um, there were, I mean, one of the things I turned up that I was not expecting, for example, was um, that uh, I, you know, I really thought the, the memos were it. They explained it. They explained when torture was turned on like a switch. But in ter it, it turns out that um, there were, um, according to the, the research I did, and it was with research assistants, and we were looking at quite a few torture reports, um, there were about, um, I want to say, 138 cases of torture in Afghanistan before a single Pentagon memo was issued, and at least 28 in uh, Guantanamo, again, before a single Pentagon directive was issued. So again, I, I would refer back first to undoing Geneva. That is, a, you, it's critical. Um, it's, you can't overstate it enough. And, and by the way, this is something that uh, the Senate Armed Services Committee found in the course of their research as well. Now, there are other reasons, though, that um, there are other things that that enabled um, the torture and abuse to occur. So first of all, having people who were not trained <laughs> to do both detention and interrogation work was a very bad idea. But also tasking the people who are raiding detainees to then guard them and then to help in some ancillary capacity with interrogations, also very bad combination. And that's where things really went bad. Um, and that occurred both in detention facilities as well as on forward operating bases. But then, you know, there are plenty of other things that happened, such as um, one of the things that Ian did that very few people in the military did was report detainee abuse. And part of this was a product of Abu Ghraib. Um, the, um, the, uh, the, okay, so Joseph Darby, Sergeant Joseph Darby was the Abu Ghraib whistleblower. And the story goes is that he discovered the images of uh, the, the abuses, the torture that occurred there on uh, Charles Greener's disc. Charles Greener was one of the main perpetrators, one of the so-called ringleader of the, the military police that was involved in this. So um, Joseph Darby, finds the images, 
on the disc, takes the, the disc, slips it under the door of the military investigators, the Army military investigators known as CID. They look at it, they initiate an investigation, they ask him questions, which he answers in confidence. Um, months pass, eventually the New Yorker and 60 Minutes breaks the story. Rumsfeld is brought in front of Senate, the Senate, right? And live on C-SPAN, one of the things that he does, one of the first things that he does, is he congratulates and thanks Joseph Darby. And this has an immediate effect. Joseph Darby is ushered out of the, the mess hall, where he was at the time, when they're broadcasting this. Um, his, his friends speared him away to some hidden location in Iraq. Um, he sleeps with a loaded pistol under his pillow. His house back home in the US is vandalized, and he enters the military equivalent of witness protection. This had an enormous chilling effect on other, other military whistleblowers. So what you had was um, you had a combination of officers looking the other way, sometimes very willfully, and this is something that a lot of Inspector General reports found, um, military whistleblowers not wanting to speak out because heaven forbid they should suffer a fate similar to Joseph Darby. And then another major problem was uh, what broke down in terms of serious military investigations and accountability, which is a disaster. You know, again, you know, hundreds if not thousands of cases of, of detainee abuse and torture that the military investigators themselves never even got. But then there were even instances where military investigators were approached by outside attorneys who were representing Abu Ghraib victims and other victims in other detention facilities um, they were given hundreds of cases of detainee abuse and torture, and they never even lifted a finger, you know. So, you know, one mechanism in terms of halting detainee abuse is accountability. And if we didn't hold top officials, you know, in the government, as well as mid-level officers, and only reserved it for a few grunts, that is not exactly making a sincere, serious effort to quash abuse. And in that way, it lived on and grew and worsened.